Welcome to the Kennedy Report. I'm Kennedy Hall. We're going to talk about Bishop Fulton Sheen, Fatima and Russia. I'm sure many people watching this remember the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He was in some ways the first televangelist. He captivated millions of people back in the day when there weren't that many channels to choose from. People tuned into his radio broadcast and his television broadcasts for decades. His books have been priceless for people in their searching for truth and in the spiritual life, not least of which was Life of Christ, which is an astonishing book. I still consult his catechetical recordings, and he had an on-screen presence that was astonishing. I actually believe he was trained in classical theater, which is probably a good thing. If we think about our great saints of the past, they were trained in rhetoric and public speaking. I think that we saw sort of a modern edition of this. He had a great love for Fatima. And he spoke about it on one of his most powerful film on television broadcast. I think it was from 1954. And he also had a great love for the Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, who wrote about the coming communist intrusion in Russia. So we thought, let's comb through the archives and put together some of the greatest clips that this great bishop tells us about Fatima. Before we show you the movie, the event itself might be called almost the birthday of the modern world. Because it was on that day that the forces of good and evil seemed to reach their peak. Our modern world with its great crises began on the date of October 13th, 1917. We will take you quickly to three cities and show you what happened on that day, first in Moscow, secondly in Rome, and third in a little village in Portugal called Fatima. October 13th, 1917, Moscow. Maria Alexandrovich, a young Russian noble lady was teaching religion to a group of 200 children in the church of the Iberian Virgin. And suddenly there was a distraction. Horsemen entered the front door, down the middle aisle, vaulted the communion rail, destroyed the icons, the statuary, the altar, and then attacked the children, killing many of them. Maria Alexandrovich ran out of the church screaming. She knew that there was an imminent revolution by the communists and she went to Lenin, whom she knew, and she said, a most terrible thing has happened. I was teaching catechism to my children. Horsemen came in, charged them, and killed some of them. Lenin said, I know it. I sent them. It was one of the events that heralded at the beginning of the terrible communist revolution that has since Harris they just don't make him like Bishop Fulton Sheen anymore, do they? The way that he speaks. He says, the birthplace of the modern world, because the forces of good and evil seem to meet their peak. This is his impression of what happened at Fatima. How true it is, especially with what we suffer through right now, which is basically the advent of global communism, which is unrelenting. Now, he begins his story, which was so fascinating, talking about that event that happened in Moscow. It's a timely reminder from this great bishop that communism starts with the hatred of God. It really is a demonic philosophy. To think the evil that must possess a man to harm children in a church the way that they did at the advent of this unholy event. The more and more I study communism, the more I can smell sulfur all over it. He then continues to show the connection between what was happening in Russia to what was going on in Rome. And he explains this supernatural timing of this consecration of a certain bishop that took place on May 13th, 1917, of all dates. Imagine that. What heavenly symmetry. Rome, October 13th, 1917. The same hour, midday. Church bells are ringing all through the city. It was a joyful event. A bishop was being consecrated. His name, Eugenio Pacelli. 
a man who then was not very well known, would one day would come face to face with this great revolutionary force and would become the greatest spiritual force in the world against it. After his consecration on that 13th day of October 1917, he went to Munich. At that particular time, the communists were very strong. They were under the leadership in Munich of Karl Liebknecht, and then one of those curious women that communism spawned. Rosa Luxemburg. And an order went out to kill 325 so-called enemies. And one of them was this same Archbishop Eugenio Pacelli. The commander of the Southern Communist Army, whose name was Tyler, Brother Siler, and his aide de camp, Bronngratz, brought in some soldiers with hand grenades. Siler himself was armed. They got into the house by a kind of a ruse, and they hid behind a curtain, waiting for the footfall of this man of whom we're speaking. And as he walked down the corridor, Siler was hiding behind a curtain. And he threw out his gun to shoot him. And the gun struck the pectoral cross on his breast. Fell to the floor. Archbishop Pacelli reached over and picked it up, handed it back to Siler. Said, here's your gun. Kill him if you wish. I am only interested in the souls of my people. Siler and Bron Grants went back and they were unable to explain why they did not get their man. They could not explain why they were haunted by that lean figure. There was only one thing they did know, and that was that from that time on, that man would be afraid of absolutely nothing in all the world. And that man became Pius XII. And that pectoral cross that he was wearing that night, I am wearing now. What an amazing tale. The cross of the bishop who became Pope Pius XII, that was what defended him against an attempt on his life with a gun. According to Bishop Sheen, this near-death experience made the man who became Pope Pius XII fearless, and he feared nothing in the world. It's amazing that Bishop Sheen was able not only to tell this story, but he actually wore that cross while doing this broadcast because he really was a man who preached without fear and fought the communists tooth and nail. Pope Pius XII swears that he saw the miracle of the sun, which took place five months from the day he was consecrated bishop, and he was laid to rest on October 13th in 1958. The links between this pope and Fatima are astounding. The good bishop then goes on to tell the story about his own time spent at Fatima. On October 13th, 1951, I was at Fatima, and there were one million people. They gathered the night before, and all night long it rained. One of those cold rains on those, one of these Portuguese mountaintops. But they stood and they knelt and they prayed for the peace of the world. I stayed with them till three o'clock and I was one of the few that had a cot. I went in and lay down and I was tired. But you could not sleep. The luxury of a cot. And here are a million people, most of whom walked 50, 75, and 100 miles over during several days in order to do penance. It's 
So the only thing to do was to get out of bed and pray with them through the night. And then the next morning, pray for the peace of the world. And when Warner Brothers did this particular film... Imagine a bishop so devoted to Fatima. One million people in prayer and supplication for peace in our world. That's what we need, a renewal of prayer and penance, begging for God's mercy and the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. As I said, Bishop Sheen was a hero against the evils of communism, and in another broadcast, he explains the danger of the errors of Russia. The following clips are taken from a show he performed called The Man Who Knew Communism Best, and he describes some of the work of the great Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky. How fitting that a bishop so devoted to Fatima would also be such a strong opponent of the evils of Russia through the lens of an actual Russian novelist. Karamazov, around 1879-80, before he died. In these works he describes communism that is to come. And he describes it, well, first of all, in Crime and Punishment, where one of the characters is Raskolnikov, the individual communist. Raskolnikov does not believe in a distinction between right and wrong, good and bad. But he's interested in the masses He's concerned about the poor, he wants to build up a social system, he's concerned with the proletariat, and this new social system that loves the masses must be built up, but in order to build it up, says Raskolnikov, you have to have money. So he kills a poor old woman pawnbroker to get money to establish his socialistic state. And he argues, she was vermin anyway. You see the system? You kill one. You ate a thousand of the masses, that's simple arithmetic. That's communism. No concern whatever for the individual person. All that matters is the party state, the totalitarian structure. And hence, let individuals, wherever they be, in Poland, Hungary, Albania, anywhere else, let them be wiped out. All that matters is the regime that professes to love the poor and tramples on them. Wow. We see Dostoevsky, and he's writing in the mid to late 1800s, and he's describing the communism that is to come, the hypocrisy of sacrificing the poor to save the poor. Everything in communism is lies, contradiction, and hypocrisy. All that matters is that the regime professes to love the poor, but instead they trample on them. This is the same thing as our lockdown communism. Make you unhealthy in the name of health. Keep you apart in the name of unity tell you that you're sick when you're not. Fulton Sheen continues. Let's see what he has to say. Dostoevsky's, then in his work, The Possessed, describes the state that has been set up by this philosophy. It's no longer concerned now with the individual communists. And Verhovinsky, Verhovinsky says, the Russian Revolution will begin with an atheistic base. You see the characters of Dostoevsky, like Kirillov, Shigalov, Verhovinsky, Father of our brothers Karamazov and others. Oh yes, they're in pages. Here they are in the possessed. But he's, these men, they, you cut a page, blood comes out, and they walk across the streets of Russia. They're living characters, they just have other names. Stalin, Lenin, Bulganov, Bulganin, Khrushchev. He wrote about them, he knew them all. 
He lived through them. He saw it coming. And so Verovinsky said that the foundation would be atheism. And then he talks to Stavrogin and he tells Stavrogin just how he must develop this system. And Stavrogin prepares for it. And so he violates a girl and then after he's violated her, he locks her in a room and there's a little opening in the door. As he sips tea, he can look at her until she goes mad. And he enjoys his tea, and finally she goes mad, and she hangs herself, and Stavrogin said, Now, now, I no longer know the distinction between right and wrong. Now I am ready to establish the system. And so the characters walk out on the pages of the possessed. And would you not think that some of these are reading from the possessed? Some of these pages were written by someone who had passed through the experiences in communism today in Russia. He suggests a system of spying. Every member of society spies on the others. And it is his duty to inform against them. All are slaves and equal in their slavery. See, equality. All comrades. They will be banished and put to death. Cicero will have his tongue cut out. Copernicus will have his eyes put out. Shakespeare will be stoned. Slaves are bound to be equal. There never has been any freedom or equality without despotism. But in the herd, everyone will be equal. The moment you have family ties or love, you get the desire for property. We'll destroy that desire. We will make use of drunkenness, slander, spying. We'll make use of every incredible corruption. We'll stifle every genius in its infancy. We will reduce all to a common denominator, complete equality. Only the necessary is the necessary. That's the motto of the whole world from now on. The world needs a shock, and that's for us, the dictators, to look after. Absolute submission. Absolute loss of individuality. But once in we see here he's describing a system that's based on atheism. It becomes a society where spying on everybody becomes the norm, almost as if it's their duty to report. He explains the tactics as they, they make use of slander, shaming, canceling, gaslighting. We've been primed for this for years. If, if Fulton Sheen was talking about this and he's talking about what was being said in the late 1800s, we've been primed for this for years. Think of what tabloids are. I mean, people's main source of enjoyment from the grocery store shelves of buying magazine, it's basically reveling in the shaming, the slandering, the canceling, the gaslighting lies and contradictions about people's personal lives. <laughs> We're almost bloodthirsty in our day to know things about somebody's personal life and to hate them based on partial truths just for fun. It's sick. He says, complete equality, only the necessary is necessary. That is the motto of the whole world. What we might say today, instead of necessary, we might say only the essential is the essential. And in fact, that has been the response of virtually the whole world. He says, the world needs a shock, and that is for the dictators to look after. Absolute submission, absolute loss of individuality. A great shock, perhaps a great reset. It's up to the oligarchs, just like it was up to the dictators. Submit to the lockdown or be made a pariah. And speaking of individuality, what a better way to take away the individuality of a man than to take away your ability to see his face. This amazing, this amazing bishop continues. And then, Dostoevsky knowing that this philosophy that has no respect for persons, that speaks of the love of the masses, will be a menace to the world, tells how it will win over. He does not mention America. But how true he was writing too soon for us, perhaps. But he told how all the intelligentsia, the riffraff, the false liberals, all of the people 
without a fine distinction of right and wrong, will follow after these individuals. And do you know, says the leader, that we are tremendously powerful already? Our power party not only consists of those who commit murder and arson, fire off pistols in the traditional fashion or bite colonels. They're only a hindrance. I reckon them all up. A teacher who laughs with children at their God is on our side. The lawyer who defends an educated murderer because he's more cultured than his victims and could not help murdering them to get money, he's one of us. The schoolboys who murder a peasant for the sake of sensation, they are ours. The juries who acquit every criminal, they are ours. The prosecutor who trembles at a trial for fear he should not seem advanced enough is ours. And among officials and intelligentsia and literary men, we have lots and lots of... He talks about the intelligentsia, the false liberals. This is exactly what we see today. Everyone's liberal, but really they just want to make someone a slave to their vices. He speaks of the children or the teacher who laughs with his children, his students, at God. It's a pretty dramatic example, but unfortunately, if you were to spend time in a lot of public institutions, especially certain schools and universities, reading from the Bible would be called hate speech. And in fact, if you did try to bring up, for example, the traditional doctrine of creation in a science class, you might literally be laughed at by the pupils, if not the teacher. He talks about the lawyer who defends an educated murderer. And this is quite the contradiction. It shows just how legalistic society at that time had already become, and for us, how much more so. Evil men can go free because they have a higher class. He goes on to say, the prosecutor who trembles at a trial for fear he should not seem advanced enough. What's another word for advancement? Being progressive, progressivism. This speaks to the ideology of progressivism. This could extend to all pro professions. Think about the doctors who are trying to speak out against things in our current day that they know are wrong, but they tremble at the fear of losing their jobs because they're not part of that progressive clique, that progressive crowd. You need to be seen as being advanced, like he says, or progressive, and with the politically correct crowd in order to be taken seriously. You'd be surprised if you talk to hospital workers right now and ask them their opinions on it. In some places, they won't tell you this publicly, but in private. It's 50-50 for and against this thing that's going on right now. Bishop Sheen sure is fired up. Let's continue. To be keen for shooting. Well, there's going to be an upheaval. There's going to be such an upset as the world has never seen before. Russia will be overwhelmed with darkness and the whole earth will weep for its gods. In 1872, but did he despair? No, he knew the world would run after these Raskolnikovs and Shigalovs and Kirillovs. No, toward the end of his life, in the journal of an author, he wrote about a soldier, socialist soldier, who would say, who said he would commit the worst crime that one could ever commit. He would steal a host. He stole a host, the Blessed Sacrament, and then said he would shoot it. He leveled his gun and he saw the image of Christ above him, and he knelt down in penance. And that, the Dostoevsky is what Russia would do. It would one day recover its soul when it got rid of these individuals who had brought ruin upon it. And then on another occasion he said, remember the young man in the land of the Gerasenes who was possessed with devils and the Lord drove the devils out of the young man into the swine and the swine were driven into the sea? Nostoyevsky said, that's my Russia. My beloved Russia, full of sores, putrefaction, foulness, corruption, full even of devils. 
But one day, these devils, the Shigalovs, the Kirillovs, the Raskolnikovs, one day these devils will be driven out of Russia and they will be pushed back and back and back into the sea. And there, there they will be drowned and it will be good enough for them. And Russia, Russia will sit at the feet of Christ and learn... I tell you, you get shivers listening to him talk. Again, bishops, priests, perhaps hang out with some Shakespearean actors and learn how to speak like that. But he says, there will be such an upset that the world has never seen before. Russia will be overwhelmed with darkness and the whole earth will weep. What does that mean in Fatima terms? If Russia is not converted, she will spread her errors over the whole world and the world will suffer. He says, the soldier would steal a host and commit the worst crime possible, even shooting the Eucharist. This was taken from his novel. The image of Christ calling that soldier to conversion, and instead, he actually did penance. That is an allegory for our time. Christ needs to be the heart of the conversion of those with hardened hearts. He says, that was one day. What, this is what one day Russia would do. But eventually, she would recover her soul. He's not specifically talking about Fatima in this actual broadcast. But what an incredible image he has of the Fatima message here. I really like the way that he describes the nation as a possessed man, like the Gerasene demoniac from the Bible. I think this could, could, could apply to much of the world right now. Speaking of the devils, he says... And there they will be driven back into the sea, and Russia will sit at the feet of Christ and learn his gospel. This sounds like the conversion of Russia. What a beautiful image to contemplate, an entire nation coming to Christ, leaving behind errors and being filled with the love of God. Let us fervently continue to pray for the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, even if it is with different terms that he spoke about it. And let's Take the words of the great Russian author who knew that true peace and the defeat of communism and those errors could only come through Jesus Christ. As we finish, I think we should bring everything full circle and listen to Bishop Sheen's vision of what would happen in Russia and the world if the message of Fatima were truly spread and the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart had truly happened. As I stood there on that altar, overlooking that great crowd of one million people, all of them waving the white handkerchiefs as white flags of purity in tribute to peace and to the Lady of Peace. My mind left that white square and went to the red square of Moscow where there were red flags tied red in the blood of the victims. Somehow I felt that on this day there was the great crisis between the white square of Fatima and the red square of Moscow. Somehow or other one felt certain and secure about peace. If we could just magnify this crowd and these petitions and this spirit throughout the world. And in my imagination I could see a great change coming over the hammer and the sickle. I could see that hammer that had beaten down so many homes and profaned so many sanctuaries. I could see it being held aloft by millions of men and looking now like a cross. And that sickle, which the communists use to cut human life like unripe wheat, I now saw as changing its figure and its symbolism and becoming, as the book of the Apocalypse said, the moon under the lady's feet. Powerful. What a great bishop. Please like and subscribe to our channel and please consider a donation. I'm Kennedy Hall. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, 
Kamu asyik.